In our previous program, we were introduced to Jericho's famous wall and the interpretation of that wall from the archaeological record by evangelical biblical archaeologist Bryant Wood, who argues that the discoveries at Jericho, modern Tel El Sultan, actually support the book of Joshua's description of the city's destruction. While a wall does indeed exist at Jericho, Wood's interpretation of its collapse to correspond with the biblical record was strained at best, manipulated at worst. In this episode, we will examine further details from the archaeological site of ancient Jericho and the parallels with the Bible story of Jericho's demise as Wood sees them to discover if they really can help substantiate the biblical account of the fall of Jericho. According to the book of Joshua, the Israelite invasion of Jericho occurred in springtime during the season of harvest, when newly picked crops would have filled the city in grain jars stored in various buildings and in stacks for drying on rooftops. And the children of Israel encamped in Gilgal and kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month at even in the plains of Jericho. And as they that bear the ark were come unto Jordan, and the feet of the priests that bear the ark were dipped in the brim of the water, for Jordan overfloweth all his banks all the time of harvest. Rahab hid them with the stalks of flax, which she had laid in order upon the roof. Astonishingly, Wood observes both Garstang and Kenyon found large quantities of grain left abandoned in the ruins of Jericho. Uh, both Garstang and Kenyon found big storage jars full of grain. This is from Garstang's dig. Kenyon found the same thing. Here's uh, her excavation area. And just to the left in one of the rooms, uh, she found, again, these large storage jars full of grain. It also tells us that the harvest had just been taken in, as we read in the Bible. It was harvest time. Uh, these jars were full. They had just uh, harvested their uh, grain. And so this verifies the time of year that the attack took place. But even though finding such grain in the ruins of the city matches the biblical description, the fact is Kenyon found an abundance of it during her excavation. In one season of work, Wood notes she recovered six bushels of grain. And according to Wood, such a quantity of grain found at an archaeological site as limited as the one in which Kenyon worked is unique in the annals of Palestinian archaeology. Wood observed that perhaps a jar or two might be found, but to find such an extensive amount of grain is exceptional. But why so much grain? For Wood, the biblical record provides an answer. Uh, it tells us that uh, uh, the siege of the city was very short. They didn't need to use any of this grain for food because it was all over in one week. Didn't drag out for months or years as the Egyptian uh, sieges of these strongly fortified Canaanite cities did. Uh, God was on the side of the Israelites, so they only needed a week. The citizens of the doomed city then were trapped by the Israelites within its defensive walls with no chance of escape. Now Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel 
none went out and none came in. Kenyon's discovery of an abundance of grain not only correlates with the biblical story of setting the conquest at the time of harvest, but also the fact that if the people of Jericho had been able to escape the siege, they would have taken the food with them, or conversely, if the Israelite campaign lasted weeks or months instead of days, the grain would have been consumed. However, the book of Joshua says that Jericho was to be a city devoted to God. This means that while the Hebrews were to confiscate any silver and gold they found, along with any vessels of brass or iron to add to Yahweh's treasury, they were not to take any personal possessions. And this is very significant because it gives evidence to the fact that the city was not plundered. Why wasn't the city plundered? Because God commanded the Israelites to offer up Jericho as an offering of the first fruits of the promised land. So they were not to take anything from the city of Jericho. And the city shall be accursed, even it, and all that are therein to the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all that are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. But all the silver and gold and vessels of brass and iron are consecrated unto the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. The considerable amount of grain found in Jericho would have been confiscated by any other invading army. Grain in biblical times was exceedingly valuable, frequently used as a monetary exchange, as Wood points out. And the grain was left. Grain was very valuable. Normally it would be taken. You could use it for food, of course, but if you had uh, an abundance of it, you could use it to barter. It was like money. When the Egyptians conquered Canaanite cities, they always recorded all of the booty from the city, including the grain. It is unthinkable that an invading army would have taken Jericho and left the grain behind. For Wood, this remarkable discovery of grain left in the ruins of Jericho helps strongly confirm the biblical story. But not only did the quantity of grain found at Jericho align it with the biblical story, but also the fact that it was found burned, along with the rest of the city. The book of Joshua states that during the destruction of Jericho, the city was set on fire. And they burnt the city with fire and all that was therein. Only the silver and the gold and the vessels of brass and of iron they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. Both Garstang and Kenyon's excavations showed evidence of a city burned by fire. So, well, now we're going to go over to the uh, southeast slope where they found the evidence for the burned city. The uh, area here to the south was dug by Garstang. You can see he dug a very large area, uncovered many uh, mud brick houses, and then this is the area dug by Kenyon, and she found exactly the same thing, a great thick <coughs> burn layer about a meter uh, or three feet thick. This is a picture of Garstang's dig there and all the buildings he uncovered. Uh, we see here the evidence for the burning as described in the Bible. Uh, here is that uh, uh, description that we've already read, how the people went up into the city when the walls fell. And then we read in uh, Joshua 6.24, they burned the city with fire and uh, all that was in it. And that's exactly what the archaeologists found. Here's Kenyon's description of that uh, destruction. She says it was complete. Walls and floors were blackened or reddened by fire. Every room was filled with fallen bricks, timbers, household utensils. In most of the rooms, the fallen debris was heavily burnt. But the collapse of the walls of the eastern rooms seems to have taken place before they were affected by the fire. Now this is very significant because she is saying the sequence that she sees taking place there was first an earthquake bringing the walls down and she's talking about the walls in the city now, the uh, houses uh, and buildings there uh, collapsed and then the fire. Earthquake and fire or let's say fallen walls and fire and that's exactly what we read in the Bible. First the city walls fell, and then the Israelites stormed the city, and they set it 
on fire. So archaeology verifies this small detail that we have in the Bible. Wood assumes that the grain discovered by Kenyon and Garstang was the result of a recent harvest. But why does he make such an assumption? He does so because he is filtering the evidence through a biblical sieve. He expects to find discoveries which parallel the biblical story, and so everything at the site is necessarily given this biblical interpretation. But Kenyon herself actually offers a much different explanation for the reason the quantity of grain was discovered in the ruins in her own writings. Kenyon notes that the grain was found in large vessels, stacked in what appears to be storage rooms on the ground floor of a multi-story dwelling. It seems probable that, as in houses of the same period found elsewhere, and as indeed in many oriental houses today, the ground floor was used for storage and that the living quarters were on the upper floors. There is no doubt that the upper floors had existed, for in the bricks and debris which piled the ground floor rooms were charred beams from the floors and pottery and other objects which had fallen from them. Based upon a number of other items discovered, Kenyon concluded the storage room in which the grain was found was part of a larger structure, and that... There, perhaps, were the premises of a corn merchant who ground the flour from the grain stored in the jars in the rooms at street level. Wood's assertion that the grain found in the remains of ancient Jericho was the result of a recent harvest reveals his evangelical Christian motivation to read the archaeological evidence through a strictly literal interpretation of the biblical text. There is nothing in the archaeological remains of Jericho to definitively prove the grain was the result of a recent harvest as opposed to the suggestion that it is evidence of the presence of a retail store owned by a corn merchant whose supply would have been, by necessity, of large quantity. The fact that the grain was left behind doesn't necessarily have to be because an army deliberately avoided it. The region where ancient Jericho resides was, and is, prone to earthquakes. Had the city been subjected to an intense seismic event, the disaster would not only have collapsed its defensive walls, but it may also have started multiple fires throughout the city, with oil lamps, thatched roofs with wooden beams, and other easily combustible material throughout the city. It isn't at all surprising that an earthquake may have set off a city-wide blaze. With the inhabitants of Jericho likely fleeing for their lives from the burning city, they would not have had enough time to gather up all the grain which Kenyon found burned in their storage jars. Perhaps some of the grain was retrieved, but people can only carry so much in a hurry. But more likely, and in perfect harmony with the available evidence, if Jericho had suffered from an earthquake, as even Wood believes, the living quarters of the upper floor, above the storage room below, which Kenyon described, would have collapsed down upon the grain supply, burying it in debris, making it impossible to retrieve for either resident or potential invader. It wasn't necessarily left behind by choice or divine mandate. But what of the Bible's mention regarding the time of year the siege on Jericho took place, which leads Wood to conclude that the grain was indeed the result of a recent harvest? Could there be significance to the timing that has nothing to do with an attack on the city. Amen. The mention of harvest time at the point in the narrative when the Israelites are preparing to cross the Jordan may simply have been a literary device to signal to the reader that what typically would have been an easy river crossing any other time of the year was made miraculous by a more heavily running torrent. The Jordan in springtime, 
at the time of harvest would not have been a slow moving stream, but a raging inundation probably a mile wide and covering a mass of tangled brush and jungle growth. The Jordan Valley is between the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea, within which is the Jordan's floodplain. The floodplain itself is some 200 yards across in some places and up to a mile wide in others. The river channel itself is from 90 to 100 feet broad, with a depth anywhere from 3 to 12 feet in some fords. The current would have been strong at harvest, due not only to the drop in elevation the river follows, 40 feet per mile near the Sea of Galilee, and an average of 9 feet per mile overall, but overflowing due to the spring rains and the melting snow from the mountains. Timing the Israelite crossing of the Jordan at such a violent time of the river's year is important to the story, because it means Yahweh was needed to perform a miracle to get the people into the Promised Land. While the people camped at the edge of the raging river, they certainly knew they needed God's help. Parting the river was proof that Yahweh was with them, and that He would deliver their enemies into their hands. While the crossing of the Red Sea as they left Egypt was both an escape and a liberation, the crossing of the Jordan meant entering into a new life and a new covenant in the Promised Land and with God. The book of Joshua describes a dramatic event just prior to the destruction of Jericho for which Wood has found correlation in the historical record. When the children of Israel had received the Ten Commandments as stone tablets from Moses on Mount Sinai during their sojourn in the wilderness, the tablets were placed in a specially designed chest known as the Ark of the Covenant, meant to house and carry the holy relics. They were the most sacred and magical of Israel's possessions a physical link between the people and their God. As the Hebrews were about to cross from the wilderness over the Jordan River and into the land of Canaan, the Bible records an astonishing event on the dawn of the Israelites' entrance into the Promised Land. Joshua 3, 9-17 And Joshua said unto the children of Israel, Come hither, and hear the words of the Lord your God. And Joshua said, Hereby ye shall know that the living God is among you, and he will, without fail, drive out from before you the Canaanites and the Hittites, and the Hivites and the Perizzites, and the Girgashites and the Amorites and the Jebusites. Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth passeth over before you into Jordan. Now therefore take you twelve men out of the tribes of Israel, out of every tribe a man, and it shall come to pass, as soon as the soles of the feet of the priests that bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, shall rest in the waters of Jordan, that the waters of Jordan shall be cut off from the waters that come down from above, and they shall stand upon an heap. And it came to pass, when the people removed from their tents to pass over Jordan, and the priests bearing the ark of the covenant before the people, and as they that bear the ark were come unto Jordan, and the feet of the priests that bear the ark were dipped in the brim of the water, for Jordan overfloweth all his banks all the time of harvest, that the waters which came down from above stood and rose up upon an heap very far from the city Adam, that is beside Zaratan, and those that came down towards the sea of the plain, even the salt sea, failed and were cut off, and the people passed over right against Jericho. And the priests that bear the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of Jordan, and all the Israelites passed over on dry ground, until all the people were passed clean over Jordan. We're told that the waters which were flowing down from above stood and rose up in one heap a great distance away at Adam. And that is uh, just... Uh, north of Jericho, some 15 miles, uh, so that the waters uh, did not flow down to the Sea of Arabah, which is 
uh, the Dead Sea, also called the Salt Sea. They were completely cut off, so the people crossed opposite Jericho. Here's a dam 15 miles north of uh, Jericho where uh, the waters were dammed up. We read in the Bible, Joshua chapter 3. Well, when we go up to that area, we see that the Jordan River flows very close to high embankments in several places there. And uh, in recorded history, we uh, f discover that uh, when an earthquake strikes in the Jordan Valley, and that is fairly frequent because it's part of the rift system, it's very unstable in the Jordan Valley, and er uh, we, they get a, a good strong earthquake about once a century there in Israel in this area. And when an earthquake strikes just right, it will actually dislodge the embankments uh, near the Jordan River and cause those embankments to uh, uh, fall down, collapse, and actually dam up the river. And the most recent occurrence of that was in modern times, in 1927. There was a very strong earthquake in Israel, did a lot of damage all across the country. And here at Adam, the Jordan River was dammed up, and the waters of the Jordan did not flow for 20 hours. It's a well-documented event. And so I believe God uh, used an earthquake to bring that about at just the right time as the Israelites were crossing the Jordan River. So it's not a folk tale. This is a reality, uh, and it's happened in history. But it, in this case, of course, uh, God was in control in directing events. Here we see a ground view, and you can see how high those embankments are and how easy it would be uh, when an earthquake comes and just uh, loosens that earth, uh, how easily it could collapse into the Jordan River and dam it up. As already mentioned, wood overreaches in trying to tie the burned grain found at Jericho with the time of a harvest. But in trying to find an explanation for how the Jordan parted before the crossing Israelites, wood completely falls over as he offers an earthquake to explain how the waters came to a stop. For wood, he has invented two major coincidental earthquakes in the span of less than a week to explain stories out of the Bible. One, to dam the Jordan River just as the priests of Yahweh stepped foot into its raging, flooded waters, and another, to tumble the walls of Jericho just as a loud trumpet blast was sounded and the children of Israel shouted with a great shout. The story of the Jordan crossing is clearly a reference back to the Israelite miraculous crossing of the Red Sea as it parted before them on their flight from Egypt. However, in the story from Joshua, Moses is no longer available to channel the power of God to part the waters of the raging river. Now that power exists through the priests of Yahweh who carry the supernatural conduit of the Ark of the Covenant. The waters of the river are a raging torrent flooding over their banks and making any normal crossing impossible. At this point of the biblical narrative, nothing but a miracle will get the children of Israel across. In the book of Joshua, the waters are said to stand up as soon as the priest's feet hit the Jordan, as if the waters themselves recognize and obey the power of God. There is no mention of an earthquake causing the river to dam, no mudslides, no earth trembling. This is purely a supernatural intervention into the natural flow of the Jordan. It bookends the Israelite flight from bondage in Egypt. From Egypt, they escaped slavery by passing between the parted waters of the Red Sea, reborn into the wilderness of the Sinai as a free people led by Moses. Then again, the people enter into the Promised Land by passing through parted waters, this time of the Jordan, reborn as a nation led by their priesthood. The imagery is so clear and straightforward 
that it makes a mockery of anyone trying to take the story literally. But that is not all. Compounding Wood's error in reading a mythologized account of the Israelites' crossing of the Jordan as history is his mistake in believing the earthquake of 1927 lends believability to the story, as it too damned the Jordan at Adam just as the Bible narrates occurred nearly 1500 years ago at the very same location. He originally wrote of this theory in his 1990 Bar article that, according to the Bible, the Jordan was apparently blocked at Adam, modern Damia, some 18 miles upstream from the fords opposite Jericho. How could this happen? Historians and Bible scholars have focused on the miraculous nature of the event with little regard for the seismology of the southern Jordan Valley. In fact, the blocking of the Jordan has happened a number of times in recent recorded history. Jericho is located in the Rift Valley, an unstable region where earthquakes are frequent. Geophysicist Amos Noor of Stanford University has studied the well-documented earthquakes of this area in an effort to find ways to predict them. In a 1927 quake, a section of a cliff 150 feet high collapsed into the Jordan near the ford at Damia, blocking the river for some 21 hours. For Wood, the 1927 earthquake resulted in the exact same situation as that described in the Biblical Book of Joshua. However, as far back as 1993, just three years after Wood's Bar article was published, a team of earthquake specialists, including the very same Amos Nur, whom Wood references in his 1990 piece, published an article which re-examined the epicenter of the 1927 Israeli earthquake, placing it instead about 12 miles south of Jericho rather than 19 miles north near Biblical Adam. In 2002, the team published a second article in the Journal of Seismology titled Erroneous Interpretations of Historical Documents Related to the Epicenter of the 1927 Jericho Earthquake in the Holy Land, confirming its original findings. Devastating to Wood's argument, the researchers reported that the story of the damming of the Jordan River during the 1927 earthquake was a fake. They noted, Doubts regarding the 1927 epicenter determination are related to the testimony of Broslovsky about the collapse of the banks of the Jordan River close to Damia, damming there by the Jordan for 21 hours. The damming of the Jordan near Damia became a crucial evidence for locating the epicenter near Damia by Ben Menahem. However, upon close examination of Broslovsky's text, it becomes clear that he relied entirely on Garston, a study that tried to relate natural disasters to miraculous biblical events. Garsting's motivations sound suspiciously familiar. As the authors delve into Garsting's motivation to report on the earthquake's effect on the Jordan River, it is hard not to imagine Wood dutifully ready to accept his story at face value and repeat it uncritically down through the years without once investigating if it were true. The article continues to paint a damning picture regarding how Garsting invented the miraculous mudslide. Garsting is the only source reporting about the Jordan's damming at Damia, and it is important to examine the context in which Garsting indicates the event. Namely, his aim to prove that Damia is the biblical City of Adam, where the Israelites crossed the Jordan under the leadership of Joshua ben Nun. Thus, he provides a scientific explanation, i.e., the occurrence of an earthquake that enabled the crossing of a flowing river without a bridge. Garstang cites the event of the damming of the Jordan River as an empirical evidence related to the 1927 earthquake. He recruits also from the Song of Deborah, that connects, in his words, the exodus of the Israelites from Edom with an earthquake. So Garstang's motivation for wanting a mudslide north of Jericho was exactly the same as Wood's. Both men strongly desired to find tangible, historical evidence which would help confirm the biblical story of the Israelite conquest of Jericho. However, when the evidence cited is invented, it can hardly be used to support the biblical narrative. But why should Garstang's story of the mudslide be doubted? Surely just because it miraculously lines up with the biblical tale is not enough. The authors of the article continue. Garstang himself was not in Palestine during the earthquake at all. His descriptions of the collapses along the banks of the Jordan River seem to be an unsuccessful copy of descriptions he had found elsewhere of similar type events. He cannot be regarded as an eyewitness. More significant than Garstang's testimony 
is the absence of any evidence supporting him. None of the documents we examined mention damming of the Jordan River. Not the documents of the British Mandate government and the British police. Not the press releases on the earthquake. Not Brar, Abel, Willis, and not even one of the German researchers who studied the earthquake in the Holy Land. So not only did Garstang lack any collaborating evidence to support his claim that the miraculous mudslide occurred, he wasn't even in the country at the time to verify the story. From where could he have learned of such a mudslide? It appears it flowed purely from his imagination and was picked up and carried on by others eager to argue for the evidence of Jericho ever since. In fact, Wood's own 1990 article references Garstang for his data regarding the damming of the Jordan at Damia, proof that the story came directly from him. Does this mean that the Jordan could never have been dammed by a mudslide? Of course not. As both the Journal of Seismology and Bryant Wood himself note, there have been other instances of the Jordan damming at other times in its history. The point here is not to discredit a natural explanation for the stoppage of the Jordan with an acknowledgement that the explanation was given a supernatural spin in the biblical tale. The point here is to emphasize how certain researchers can let their religious bias influence how they read material, how they present material, and how that bias guides or blinds them to particular data. As the authors of the article in the Journal of Seismology finish their examination of Garsting's mudslide claim conclude, Besides its general unreliability, there are additional methodological grounds for rejecting Garsting's testimony. Garsting has an interest in adopting the story of damming the Jordan River in Damia. By calling on the earthquake-triggered bank collapse, he gets a scientific explanation for his thesis of crossing the Jordan River by the Israelites at Damia toward Jericho. However, we adopt the accepted methodological rule in historical research, which states that a source with an interest should not be accepted as evidence, particularly if it is without any support. Therefore, damming of the Jordan River during the earthquake of 1927 in Damia cannot be regarded as reliable. If Garstang's interest is a reason for rejecting his testimony, what about Bryant Woods? Recall Woods' mission statement as part of his Associates for Biblical Research to resolve apparent conflicts between the findings of archaeology and science in the Bible. And this based upon the organization's statement of faith that Wood is committed to a belief in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments as the verbally inspired Word of God, inerrant in their original writings, and of supreme and final authority in faith and life. In fact, Wood has stated that if any disagreement between modern scholarship and what is written in the Bible arises, that one should always side with the ancient religious document. If there is a conflict between an ancient text and modern scholarship, and you had to go with one or the other because they were in opposition to each other, which one would you see as the most reliable source, the modern scholars or the ancient text? Well, I think we have to go with the folks who wrote the text way back in antiquity. They were closer to the events than we are today. Wood fails to keep in mind that the scientific method teaches us justification for a hypothesis depends more upon the results of our efforts to disprove that hypothesis than it does on evidence which merely appears to be consistent with it. The search for evidence must take into account the various biases, filters, fallacies, and distortions that might affect the search for evidence itself, such as relying on a religious belief as a control, rejecting certain evidence on the ground that they conflict or do not comport well with those beliefs.
Attempting to support parallels between the Book of Joshua and archaeological discoveries made at the site of ancient Jericho, Wood also examined an important artifact he felt was a marker, which helped date the site to the biblical chronologically correct date for the city's destruction in 1400 BCE. The marker came by way of scarabs that Garstang had found in tombs associated with the ancient city. Here we see John Garstang uh, photographing pottery that he found in a tomb uh, not far from the site of the city, a couple of kilometers away. And there he found a cemetery. He excavated a number of the tombs in the cemetery. And they provided valuable information for him that allowed him to date the destruction level up on the tell. Because in this uh, burial, uh, this one and another one nearby, he found what we call scarabs. These are small amulets. Scarab uh, means beetle. I think it's French. Uh, and uh, these amulets are shaped like a beetle. They have a flat bottom, kind of a rounded top. And then on that flat bottom, they would uh, inscribe a person's name or just some kind of a uh, pictorial representation or some uh, geometric motif or something like that. Uh, he found a number of these scarabs that had on the bottom names of Egyptian pharaohs. Of course, we can date the pharaohs uh, through Egyptian history. And so this uh, gave him uh, datable material. The pottery found in association with those scarabs, uh, he was able to date to the time period of the 15th century BC, uh, the time just before the conquest. So this uh, allowed him then, when he found that same kind of pottery on the tell, to date the destruction to about 1400 BC. Here are some examples of those uh, scarabs. Uh, Hatshepsut, that, uh, she's a very famous queen of Egypt. And uh, her scarab is quite rare. And so it's, uh, it's not a family heirloom that would have uh, been held on to for hundreds of years. It's uh, contemporary with the uh, material uh, that uh, Garstang found it with there in the cemetery. Thutmosis III, the next pharaoh, uh, ruling uh, right up until a few years before the uh, exodus from Egypt. And then we have Amenhotep III ruling uh, around 1400 or maybe even the uh, uh, early 1300s BC. As Wood noted in his 1990 Bar article, the continuous nature of the Scarab series suggests that the cemetery was in active use up to the end of the late Bronze I period. Which means, for Wood, that Jericho had indeed been occupied at the time the Bible places Joshua and the Hebrews at the doorstep of the city. Wood's claim that Garstang's scarabs form a continuous series extending from the 18th century BCE in the Middle Bronze period up through the time of Joshua's conquest of the city in the Late Bronze Age in 1400 BCE was already addressed and rejected by Kenyon herself nearly 40 years before Wood asserted the idea. She noted in her writings the problem with using the scarabs for dating the ruins. Examination of the tombs shows how unreliable stratification by absolute level within the tombs can be, owing to the habit of mounding up earlier materials round the edge when later burials are put in. The occurrence of late Bronze Age objects at the same absolute level as middle Bronze Age ones does not therefore indicate an overlap of forms. Moreover, the other dating criterion used, scarabs of the period for which the pottery seems to indicate a gap, is not safe scarabs are the sort of thing liable to be heirlooms. But Wood makes a claim that the Hesepchute scarab is quite rare, one which would help provide evidence of a late dating for the fall of Jericho, since her scarabs were not kept or copied, and therefore are an excellent chronological indicator. But again, Wood is mistaken. The scarabs are discussed in James Weinstein's article, Archaeological Reality found in the collection Exodus, The Egyptian Evidence, 
an anthology of essays presented at a conference of scholars and archaeologists sponsored cooperatively by Brown University's Program in Judaic Studies, Program in Ancient Studies, and the Center for Old World Archaeology and Art in order to discuss Egyptian archaeological research in the area of the biblical exodus. Weinstein corrects Wood's reliance on the Hesepchut scarab as an excellent chronological indicator by noting, a few royal name seals in a single tomb is hardly adequate evidence to postulate a significant and continuous occupation on the mound itself in the 15th century BC. His view that the context of the Hatshepsut scarab should be contemporary with that pharaoh's reign because the scarab containing her name would not have been kept as an heirloom is incorrect. There are at least two other scarabs from Palestine that name Hatshepsut. One comes from the 13th century BC level of Beth Shein. The other Hatshepsut scarab may have been a surface find at Tel Yitzvahak. Weinstein is an adjunct professor at Cornell University in the Department of Classics with research specialties in Egypt and the Levant, scarabs, and the chronology of the ancient Near East. Weinstein also is a co-editor of the Bulletin of the American Schools of Oriental Research, an interdisciplinary English language journal which includes technical articles covering the entire Near East and Eastern Mediterranean world from the Paleolithic period through Islamic times. Weinstein wrote his piece critical of Wood's use of Egyptian scarabs to date the destruction of Jericho in 1992, only two years after Wood's article in Biblical Archaeology Review was published. And yet, over a decade into the 21st century, Wood continues to make the claim that the Egyptian scarabs found at Jericho, and the Hesepchut scarab in particular, can be used to help establish the date of Jericho's destruction to 1400 BCE helping to solve the apparent conflicts between the findings of archaeology and science and the Bible. In our next episode, we will examine the heart of Wood's argument to redate the destruction of Jericho from Kathleen Kenyon's 1550 BCE to the biblical 1400. Has Wood been able to discover a type of pottery in the remains at Jericho that will definitively prove the Bible's story? And can modern radiocarbon dating put to rest what has been a debate that has raged for the better part of a half century?